Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I'm Seth Beckman, Dean of the College of Fine Arts here at Ball State. It is great to be with all of you today. And it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Melina Simone Bacon, a distinguished alumna and co-founder of the renowned Indianapolis-based cultural development firm and creative agency, Gang Gang. Gang Gang's mission deeply aligns with ours at Ball State, community and commitment to fostering creativity and engagement. And it resonates deeply also, of course, with our core values. And by providing platforms for marginalized voices and providing and promoting equitable opportunities for cultural expression, Molly, she goes by Molly, and her team exemplify the transformative potential of creative leadership and embody the spirit of both innovation and social consciousness. And again, through her work at Gang Gang, she endeavors to reshape the landscape that we live and work in by addressing the underrepresentation of creatives of color and fostering equity, beauty, inclusivity in our communities across cities and other groups. We are so privileged to have Molly back to our campus for her second partnership with the College of Fine Arts, the College of Communication, Information, and Media, and our entire campus. Her insights into the intersections of art, equity, and community are inspirational for all of us, and they inspire us to become, again, more socially responsible and empathetic as we lead in pursuit of a more just and inclusive world. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Melina Simone Bacon. Yes, sir. Thanks for the long clap. Uh, okay, I'm just like testing sound right now, so this is fine. Hi, sister. Um, I'm just giving myself permission to like get comfortable because I watched the video of last year and I was like trapped to the podium and you could tell and I was like, trapped. So I'm trying to be less nervous so I can be a little less trapped. So hi. Hi. Are you guys ready to have fun? Yes, sir. Awesome. I don't, I don't think I need that at all. Anyway, welcome um, and thank you to Ball State, like thank you to the leadership um, for having me and thank you for coming, everyone. This is, um, this is a neat mix of students and faculty and kind of general public, so it's a diverse group and that's really, really awesome. Um, I'm joined by my beautiful husband and co-founder, Alan Bacon, who's back there. And, <laughs> And a good portion of the rock star team at Gang Gang, who's out there and everywhere, <laughs> including DJ K Nags here with me on stage. K Nags, ED. Um, so it is. It, it really is an honor just to like be in, invited here and asked to just share thoughts and learnings. That's really interesting. Like I just get to share thoughts and learnings. Um, so thank you and thank you to the CFA. Um, I decided not to do a long personal intro for this lecture. Somebody told me to because it would take up 15 minutes. But no, no, I thought I did that last year and we'll put it online. And I'd rather try hard to articulate my thoughts. Um, so I'll give a quick version of my life up until this moment. I was raised in Indianapolis by a Spanish-speaking Caribbean dad from St. Croix whom I recently lost and that's still um, really hard to believe and I'm very close to my mother, who has studied anatomy, physiology, and oncology for the last 40 years. I went to a very small all-black church school until third grade. Then I went to small majority white private schools before coming here to Ball State. So, <laughs> that was it. Um, I was an average kid here. I didn't have any special accomplishments. There's nothing that this school would remember me for besides my parking tickets. Um, <laughs> So between coming here for school and coming back here now has been 20 years exactly. So essentially my 20s and my 30s, getting thrown everything and then sorting everything, starting a career and confirming a career. For 20 years, I've basically been testing my theory 
that the arts can pay my friends because they're the, art the artist. Plus make cities better, plus pay me if I work at this long enough and well enough. As it turns out, part of that is true. Most of that is true. If I work at creating infrastructure for artists long enough, I can pay artist friends, make cities better, and pay myself, give or take. What I didn't see coming was what infrastructure was in place working against my plan, and that there's been a mind trick being played to make me think that I should be struggling at this type of work at all. Within that 20 years, in 2020, Alan and I let our instincts lead and co-founded Gang Gang. What felt like survival mode confirmed our 2020 theory, that the arts have sustained us all because of their central message of love. Therefore, they are our strongest, most viable option now to reconnect people and cities for a sustainable future. Gang Gang's mission felt like something we knew and something we needed to know more of something that was before and bigger than us and something that would be here after. It has been a powerful, faith-filled journey with this profound discovery that the arts have sustained this very country because of their central message and method of love. We built Gang Gang in one day and raised $250,000 in 30 days with that power in mind. We maintain one goal, to center beauty, equity, and culture in cities by activating the creative economy. Gang Gang was born almost out of necessity to narrate what was happening before all of our eyes. Remember, and please don't devalue those 30-foot Black Lives Matter letters that were painted on streets throughout North America. The arts were the only thing standing when cities stopped. Not even church happened. We lost holidays with COVID. We had our music, our books, online DJ battles, film, and we craved storytelling. The arts became the new religion when people needed assurance and when people needed hope. In four years since 2020, Gang Gang has generated a new narrative for the arts in central Indiana. We know how sacred this thing is and have brokered new partnerships and opportunities for artists. Our team has changed the way indie government does its engagement for city planning. Gang Gang has produced a fine art fair called Butter that has put more than $800,000 into artist households, most of whom are in central Indiana. And we're one month away from an inaugural rock fest to celebrate the black creators of the genre. Woo! Woo! <laughs> it's, I made rock and roll, it's May 18th. But this is all in an effort to program truth and to generate revenue in the creative economy because we know it works to make cities stronger and people happier. Here's a video about Gang Gang. This is an organization, like it's a thing but it needs to be incubated somewhere for a while before it can really take off on its own. What's it called? Gang gang. Gang gang. Gang gang. Gang gang. Gang gang. Gang gang. Gang gang culture. Gang gang. Gang gang. Gang gang. Gang gang. An Indianapolis-based cultural development firm that says it is on a mission to produce, promote, and preserve culture to grow the creative economy. In 2020, the founders Molly and Allen had an idea to reveal the power of the creative economy by starting an organization focused on causing a cultural renaissance. And so that's kind of like a startup, but it's a cultural startup. That's actually really cool to think about a cultural startup. Could Indianapolis have its first cultural startup? Right. And it actually blossoms fairly quickly. Short answer? Long answer. This is not a small town idea. No, this is, this a... is right away national grant. This is worth more than a department at an organization. This is worth more than an equity plan. This deserves 
focus and somebody purely thinking about equity within the arts in Indianapolis. Get to the good shit. And that's what they did. They got a building, created a headquarters, and got to work. I retire people. Yeah. Yeah. We have a staff. One of the things about the African American culture is that we are one of the most creative people in the world. This is how we, we grow the entrepreneurial system and accelerate it. Because people can now get paid for doing art and culture. following their journey for the last two years, and from what we can tell, they have been chasing the answer to a not so simple question. How do you make an equitable creative economy? Well, the short answer is, there absolutely is no short answer. Long answer? Yes, to find out. All right, all right. One! 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 Shout out Mark Bessiaki. He's the guy who makes Gang Gangs. Um, he made that video, makes Gang Gangs video. Evie. Woo! All right, so the title for today's time is The World According to Me. That's what's been public. The subtitle that I've had at the top of my notes uh, tells you my approach to this, which is Molly imagines a world that has a mass rebuking of racial hierarchy especially as a central way of life. In other words, what would life be like for everyone if it wasn't centered on white power? What would life be like if it weren't structured on white power? So this is kind of a part two from last year when I lectured here and the title was, Is DEI Over? At that time, people were already starting to question how long the focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion would last. DEI is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and so here's a snippet from last year. Getting into DEI requires hearing a fundamental truth, that racial hierarchy is not only a construct, but was constructed. Creating race based human enslavement was a grand mistake by people trying to improve their place, their city, their nation. Someone had the thought, I need the mind, skill, and bodies of these people, but in order to get that, I need to trick them and everyone hereafter into thinking that they are less valuable than all the others. I need for myself to think that, and then I'm going to convince others that these people were actually even made for cruel treatment. The idea worked so well that even after enslavement ended, his idea is still blinding us today. Right here in this room, we're living within that terrible, painful idea to say that Africans specifically would be the least among these. Europeans did create a massive manipulation system that allowed for mental and physical enslavement based on race, and America wouldn't exist without that. We are a mere 140 years after the end of that physical enslavement, and we've created an environment in which we don't talk or learn about the beginning of it or before it. No one wanted us to know then and probably not now, when I take a step back at this massive production, I have to wonder, was there not an out? Was there not an escape plan? Is no one investigating the origins of this racist behavior so that we might find a proper solution? When our world came to a screeching halt in 2020, the DEI handbook was not enough. For future cities to get the most out of DEI, we will have to call upon the artists. So that was last year, and it was pretty spawn, sadly. 
Um, I did not see abortion rights nor affirmative action being taken away right after. And although we knew DEI funding would dry up, I did not expect such a sudden and massive rebuking of undoing racism efforts. Very suddenly, it's not even as easy to talk about again. And our nation's politics are adding an angle that is simply overwhelming. We're at war. We're in global warming. If you're a Bible scholar, we're not far from the environment described for the second coming. We're all still traumatized from being on lockdown and forced to wear masks and get nasal swabs. And they tried to take down Beyonce. So yes, I called this mass hysteria, but certainly not at this scale and not so fast. At Gang Gang, we kept studying like the cultural research lab that we are. And the more we dug into the thinking, we found a question. If art and culture are a world power tool to revitalize and make cities equitable, why hasn't this been a major strategy all along? Who knows this to be true? And who has done this well? What cities have let culture become their economic development and planning strategy? Is that why New York and LA are so successful? Is that what we're learning from Detroit? And who decided artists should be starving? We created entire villages and cathedrals and monuments by artists, but then built society system to not include them, not as a professional service or even a viable industry, and especially not for the nation of artists who were brought here to keep creating. Well, friends, I have learned some incredible things. My young and early wisdom are so new that I'm reminded of Frederick Douglass's reference to how young the United States are. America is a speck of time compared to great nations, he said. We have an opportunity to hope for a nation that greatly needs it, he said. So audience, please like frame your minds with me around the fact that America is young. America as a country, our country, is still in its impressionable stage, says the author. America founded itself recently, much like I founded my startup recently, and it's not even 250 years old. When you look up the oldest countries in the world, we're not on the top 10 list, nor are we on the top 25 list. This is fascinating. We are a baby nation. Throughout time, the world has seen many nations. Nations can be countries. They are large groups of people that create ways of life and traditions in a geographic place, places. When Africans landed in ships here, the ones that were alive were described as a nation of artists. The enormous tribes that existed and built empires and castles and cathedrals, those were great nations that made a way of life over thousands of years. Our country, America the Beautiful, is only 248 years old. So the thought of being a toddler country means one, we want to have fun, period. Two, <laughs> we are at the end of the Founding Fathers' initial concept of how this country should be run. That means that the society they constructed very intricately, painfully, purposely, is still what we're practicing and living within right now. So basically, what's going on is the cracking of a giant lie that was supposed to last for a lot longer than it is. A lie that our country can only function on the belief that people of African descent are unworthy of humane treatment. It was an incredible story, an enormous evil plan, but it only lasted 248 years. To make explicit what's been going on for the past nearly 500 years, the world has governed itself on racial hierarchy, meaning it's been decided to make the brand of African descendants less than human. The world is thousands of years old, and not only have we come up with something as terrible as race-based hierarchy, but we also formed an entire country, America, um, to function by way of horrific abuse and rebranding of an entire people. We decided they would not be called queens and kings 
And we would not acknowledge their artistry and spirituality and strength. In our country, we say, the closer you are to white, the safer you will be. The moment we're in now is realizing what has been happening. A massive, massive experiment for first the Europeans and then white Americans to dominate world economic powers by way of African rebranding. They decided to manipulate their own minds and their friends and families to create a new way of thinking and living that they thought would last forever. And to many of them, it did. We're the country that upholds and teaches racism as a way of life. We're the country that taught the human family how the Holocaust could work. Nazi Germany learned how to accomplish the Holocaust from what had just taken place in the United States. It's because of how we were founded that the entire globe thinks of and treats people of African descent differently than everyone else. This capturing of the black body and its history is why we all know racism, and it's also why people think so highly of America and why our young nation has seen such enormous success. The arts in America are a world power that has largely been fueled by people of color, making the industry as economically segregated as it is. In many ways, America's commitment to racism requires denial of its artistic history and practices. It's a refusal of acknowledging that which has sustained us. The only way we've survived this thing is by way of love. The only way I'm here to talk about it, the only way we're still able to sing and laugh is because I am indeed talking about love. Years ago, um, I was at the National Humanities, National, at the NHE, the Humanities Conference that happens every year. And I heard a woman say that it is the purpose of humans to love one another. She said that our decision to assign hierarchy is a loveless system, and it has gotten us away from our purpose as people. Very simply, humanity needs to get back to its purpose, she offered. So I realized like, the world's predicament based on that love as purpose teaching. Our nation is about to war against its own infrastructure, and the only way it knows how to operate, which is wild. What we can feel is the grand awakening of our own minds, our own histories and identities that have us looking at our country like, what? You set this up how? And for me to live like what? This system required an evil plan and love is the only thing that can save it. That's what's happening and that's what you can feel. America is having a huge, bold conversation about who she is and who she wants to be and she is double-minded in all her ways. So what do we do? What's the solution? Gang Gang's vision is love-centered cities now. We bring it to the city level because change starts with people and people make up the way cities behave. Love as a plan can work just like evil as a plan does. Unity as a plan works just like intentionality to divide. Being kind means you can be not, if you do one, you know, you can do the other. So discussing love as part of city governance is as easy as we call, you know, the evil plaguing our cities. I do want to shout out Adam Teeth, Brad Bobian, and Brooke Thomas for their pre-COVID work to introduce love into government planning in Indianapolis years ago. So this lecture is less about how and kind of more about permission Yes, we can consider an alternative way of living. Yes, we can better equip creative thinkers and encourage innovation in the arts for better cities. Yes, we can even think about love as a strategy for behavior. For example, last year for Butter 2023, we showed the distinction between love and evil, sin and good, lightness and darkness, for they are indeed distinct and separate with vastly different missions. At Gang Gang, we describe our work as a new model experiment for equitable cities by way of the arts. And that lens helps you to like move more quickly and not get stuck in planning or even wondering. 
It also puts things in perspective and lets you know that you can try. You can take risks. Some things will work. Some things will ruin everything. Some things will change everything. Gang Gang itself is a big experiment. The Black Rock Fest we're organizing ne next month is a grand experiment in national advocacy. Doctors practice and experiment on people all the time. Designers experiment with messages. We've learned today that we're at the very end of America's first experiment as a way of operating. This is America's success model. It's operations playbook. And it's time to opt out. The world is at a place where the human family has lost sense of its purpose. And we are the new strategic planners. It's up to us to choose the hard, more appropriate path, the one that centers beauty, equity, and our cultures, one based on our ultimate purpose, and the only one that will sustain us. That's it, thank you, love you. Yes, sir. And now maybe we'll enjoy DJ K Nags, and then I think there's a meet and greet in the lobby, unless there's something different. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, sir. <laughs>